Hi, friends, and welcome to another episode of Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast designed to help you deepen your faith, or as we love to call it, the show that helps you grow. That's right. It is the show that helps you grow. My name is Jason. I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Linda. We are on the spiritual growth team at Saddleback, and we're excited today to talk kind of a a little bit of a deep dive into our call to stewardship. Mm Mm-hmm. So let's just kind of set the picture a little bit of what we're talking about when we talk about stewardship. So let's start by comparing and contrasting a little bit how the secular world defines stewardship and how, or I should say, what a biblical definition of stewardship looks like. So first, we can go back to our trusty dictionary, Webster's, and kind of do, you know, and look at what does it say about stewardship. It's It says... The conducting, supervising, or managing of something especially, or in other words, uh, the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So we can kind of get a sense of that. Mm-hmm. Taking care of something, taking a, taking special care of something that's been entrusted to us. Now, in the Holman Bible Dictionary, it talks about stewardship like this. Utilizing and managing all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. Now, you can see that there's, again, some things are the same as we're talking about these things. We're talking about taking special care of something that's been entrusted to us. Now, but in the Bible dictionary, it makes clear the point that it is God who has entrusted things Mm -hmm. to us and we are managing his resources. And we're not just doing it just because right. <laughs> we're doing it for the glory of God and for the betterment of his uh, creation. So we see in there, it's not just the duty, it's also the task before it. It's the purpose behind it. Mm-hmm. There's a website that that we use sometimes called uh, Got Questions. And really, it's a good place to go and check out any sort of Bible questions you can have. You can find pretty much answers to everything on right. there. Right. <laughs> Um, but we saw this thing on stewardship that we felt that was worth reading. It says, stewardship defines our practical obedience in the administration of everything under our control, everything entrusted to us. It is the consecration of oneself in possessions to God's service. Stewardship acknowledges in practice that we do not have the right of control over ourselves or our property. God has that control. It means that stewards of God, we are managers of that which belongs to God, and we are under his constant authority as we administer his affairs. So that just sets a really good yeah. picture. It puts God first, mm-hmm. and it really defines our role as almost executors. Sure of that which is God's mm-hmm. knowing that God is there. It's not like God has left. He hasn't, right. he, he hasn't just said, here's all the goods. I'm going to go on vacation for right. a while. Come, you know, it's, he's there. It's still his. And he, and he is, and he is a part of this with us, mm-hmm. but he has entrusted it to us. And so that's a part of, uh, of what we'll dive deep into is kind of, um, why God did this, why stewardship Mm -hmm. too, Mm -hmm. and how it is something that will grow us. But first let's do kind of a little overview of some good examples of stewardship seen in the Bible. Sure. So from the very beginning, one of the first commands that God actually gave to people was in Genesis 1, when he gave mankind the responsibility of stewardship of the earth. This is what it says. It says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So one of God's first things that he instructs people to do is to care for the world that he has just made. All the way back in the beginning of Genesis, the from the beginning, beginning of mankind, we got this or, this this order, this directive. Right. Yeah. So this is God's first real task for us is entrusting us with caring for what he has made. Um, I love how R.C. Sproul sort of elaborated on this. He said, God installed Adam and Eve as his vice regents, those who were to rule in his stead over all creation. And this is important. It says, it's not that God granted independent ownership of the planet to 
to man to humankind and that's i think sometimes how we treat it right like it's ours we're going to do with it as we please but it says he it remains his possession but god called adam and eve to exercise authority over animals plants seas rivers sky and the environment they were not to exercise authority like a reckless tyrant who has carte blanche to do anything he wants for god didn't make adam and eve owners of the earth he made them stewards of the earth who were to act in his name and for his glory. That I, just, was, I just wanted to call out, you said carte blanche very nicely. Oh, well, thank you. It just sounded, it just sounded very, like, it sounded like you've said it many times. Like, it's a part of, anyway, I just wanted to. <laughs> so if, if, you, if you're wondering why I said that, go back, just hit that rewind 15 seconds button and listen to Linda say a carte blanche again. It just flowed nicely. Anyway. Can, continue. <laughs> now that I'm laughing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I appreciated the fact that even what in what R.C. Sproul was saying, it goes back to the definition that we talked about before, that he entrusts us to care for it for his glory. That's that's a huge part of what we're doing. It's it's to bring him glory. It's not to serve just ourselves. Yeah, it wasn't. It's it's not that God just wanted to give us something to do. Right. <laughs> it's not. It's you know he's not saying I, well I made people. <laughs> now what? Now what? <laughs> You know, huh. you got to give them something to do. I guess I'll just have them <laughs> take care of all this other stuff. You know, it, it was intentional. It's mm-hmm. for a reason. God doesn't do things without a reason. And right. so when we start to ask the question of the purpose behind stuff, mm-hmm. is we can really get that sense of, of almost like, okay, wow. Okay, there's something for us that God mm-hmm. wants us to do. Mm-hmm. And then there's some, and then there, it goes back to him. Everything is points back to God. Absolutely. And so it's all towards... Get, it's it's all about us getting to bring God glory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, a little bit later in Genesis, another example of stewardship we see is in Genesis 39. And this is kind of during the story of Joseph. And if you know the story of Joseph, you know that he had some really tough times. He got sold into slavery. He ends up in Egypt and he's there in Pot- in Potiphar's house and he gets made the steward over Potiphar's entire household. That means that he was to care for everything, but to honor his, the one who had entrusted him, which was Potiphar. I can't think of Potiphar without singing the song from Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Will you sing it? Potiphar was counting shekels in his den below the bedroom when he heard a mighty rumpus scattering above him. Anyway, and then it continues. But uh, anyway, that's my Potiphar little... (laughs) <laughs> tangent and any day when Jason <laughs> sings is a good day yeah. um but this just reminds us about the concept of steward in in the ancient world which was a person who was given the responsibility and authority to rule over the affairs of the entire household and this was why when Potiphar's wife accused Joseph I mean it was a big deal because he was responsible to Potiphar for how he he treated and stewarded everything, including the fact that he had access to his wife. And yeah. so even though it was a false accusing, that's why Potiphar had to take drastic action when that happened. Well, and then, yeah, and then as we know from Joseph's story, like that that continues. He becomes right. not just the steward of Potiphar's house, he becomes the steward of all of Egypt. Right. <laughs> so there's <laughs> <You know>? that. <laughs> because he was, um, as we're going to see in this next parable, that we're going to look at one that Jesus told, he was faithful in little so he was later entrusted with much. Yeah. So the last sort of biblical example I want to walk through is it's called the parable of the bags of gold. Some people call it the parable of the talents. It's found in Matthew 25. I'm actually going to read um, a few verses here just to kind of give us a sense of what happened. This instead is of story time. Yeah, Linda. story time. So this is, again, uh, Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Again, this is Jesus speaking, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put the money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And his master replied, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. So here is what belongs to you. And his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have at least received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have abundance. But whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. There was a couple things I noticed as I was reading in this story. And the first thing is that they weren't all entrusted with the same amount. I was literally, okay, I'm, I'm glad you're going to bring this up because I've, I've listened to this parable a ton of times. Sure. And this time... For the first, probably the first time, the line to each according to his ability sure. really stood out. Yeah. Because that that insinuates that the master knew right. in advance, that the, which means that they had a reputation before them. Absolutely. You know, so anyway. Absolutely. But the other thing that on that same point is that the, the one who received two didn't look at the one who received five and says, hey, he has more than me. He was faithful with, with what he'd been given. Mm-hmm. He didn't compare amounts. He did, you know, he said, this is what I've been given. I think sometimes it's like, well, I'd be a good steward if I had more to be a steward of. Yeah. But no, each one. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me more, I promise I'll do good. <laughs> but with what you've given me, what can but I do? But I'm bored. <laughs> I don't know why we had to take on act, like different voices for that. But anyway. Because I don't know. <laughs> but so anyway, I just, I thought that was interesting. Um, it's just the fact that God has called us to be faithful with what he's given us. The other thing that struck me is that the the one the, who had received only one bag, he operated from that that sense of, of scarcity of like, look, this is all I've got and I better have it when he gets back. I'm mm-hmm. afraid I'm going to bury it. And I'm not going to lie, I've probably done that. Yeah. <laughs> I've probably totally. operated that way many times where I just think, boy, if I give this away, I won't have it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's that's it, definitely boring. And so, and we see from all of these different examples, going back from Genesis one to the story of Joseph in Genesis thirty nine through fifty, and then through, um, through the parable of the talents or the bags of gold, is it's it's creating this kind of example, this picture in the Bible of stewardship of that God has given to us in different areas, mm-hmm. and that He has called us to be caretakers of this. Yeah. He's called us to not just forget about it, to not be reckless or careless with it, but instead with what he has given us to be stewards. And often we get into um, a single frame of mind yeah. where we just think of this in terms of money. Right. But as we see from Genesis 1, or in, even as we see... When there from, wasn't money. <laughs> yeah, when there wasn't money, right? Even as we see from the story of Joseph and talking about the household, it wasn't just the money that he was in charge of. He was in charge of all different areas of the mm-hmm. household and then later all different areas of Egypt. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we see that we're actually um, called to steward more. And in fact, we can really think about stewardship in terms of whole person thought is that God has, has given to us in every area of our life. And so we are called to be stewards of that. So it, it, it's really to think about it as a guiding principle and how we think about and use everything that we have and everything that we are. And the more that you think about it, it turns out it's really is you can look at every aspect of Christian discipleship can be defined in terms of stewardship. Right. You can, so like if we wanted to talk about the five purposes is we can look at that in a framework of stewardship. Worship, for example, is stewardship of the faith that God has given us. It's the stewardship of our relationship with God, that we are a creature who is called to connect with our creator, Mm -hmm. that the giving of ourselves to God through praise and prayer and acts of commitment, that we are called to steward the life that God has given us into a life that is giving 
glory and praise to God. Right. Evangelism is stewardship of the gospel. Mm-hmm. God has given us this good news. He has right. given us the Bible. He has given us our own stories of, of, of coming to faith, of transformation, of, of life change. He has given us the gospel. And so we are called to be stewards of that, to not right. just keep that good news for right. ourselves, but to share it. Go and tell. Exactly. Go tell it on that mountain. Right on. Um, service, you know, if we're looking at the, at the five purposes, a ministry can be understood as the stewardship of life and our gifts and our abilities and our experiences. In the past, we've talked about shape before on this podcast, that we, with, that we are interested with our spiritual gift, our heart, our abilities, our personality, our experiences mm-hmm. that we have been given. And we are called to steward those into serving other people, to serving uh, the kingdom of God, uh, to serving those in need. Mm-hmm. Spiritual disciplines are a part of Christian stewardship, right? It, it's really, it's thinking about the stewardship of time. It's, it's the stewardship of our attention. Right. Um, it, we are called to set aside time to have a daily quiet time with God. Mm. Reading the Bible and prayer. This is stewardship of our time. It's stewardship of our thought life, our attention. That's the discipleship part as we're talking about um, how stewardship can play out in the five purposes. So w- 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 we can see that stewardship is not just thinking about money. Right. It's a full, whole person concept. But money is obviously a, a direct, like easy to see way. Right. And there's a reason that the Bible talks so much about it. So, so Linda, help us kind of understand this kingdom perspective of stewardship as it relates to a financial health. Yeah, sure. So, Like Jason so eloquently said, it's not just about money, but money is probably the place where it's, that's one of the things that is the hardest for us, I think. And I think that's probably why Jesus talked so much about it, because he knew we'd struggle with it. He knew that it would be the place where we would have the hardest time. Um, But see, when we're talking about it from this vantage point with this big definition of stewardship as whole life stewardship, as everything entrusted to us, we are to steward for the glory of God. When we talk about money, now now we're not just saying, okay, well, you made this much, you need to give this percentage as a mathematical thing. Now we're talking about faithfully and obediently caring for what God has entrusted to us. So we come at it from a different vantage point. Because really, it's gratitude and humble recognition of God's sovereign rule over us and obedience to his word, because he's called us to this. He's told us, you're entrusted with it. And he has actually, in this one way, he hasn't said how long our quiet time is supposed to be, but he has said, he has called us to, you know, give a percentage back to him. And, and so, but that is our stewardship, right? But this can feel like a lot. And while we've made this point that it's about more than money, it just is... This is the place that's so hard for it because our culture, our culture tells us the exact opposite message everywhere we turn. It says, you've earned it. It's yours. Do with it what you want. Whatever makes you happy, just do that. Well, if you think about the ebb and flow of a daily life, right? Right. You go to work to make money. Right. And then you go home, you get a bill saying that you owe somebody money. Right. So it's, 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 if you think about your life in terms of just constant transactions. Now, again, I don't encourage you to think about your life in terms of constant (laughs) transactions, but we can understand how that can be kind of ingrained in us to think about this. I need to make the money in order to give the money to the person I am paying for their service or good. And so it's, it's understandable. Absolutely. That we start thinking about like, I need to hoard I need, I, I need to be so focused on right. attaining and keeping so that I can give to what I need to give. Absolutely. I mean, we give the best hours of our day to earning money. Yeah. I mean, hopefully you're doing something you love at your job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hopefully you <laughs> are, are, are thinking about your job in, in terms of how to glorify God. We'll have a whole episode later on vocational health and yes. we'll talk about that. <laughs> but the reality is that your best waking hours are spent earning the money to do the things you need and want to do. But just because the world operates that way doesn't mean we have to operate that way. What Paul reminded us 
in Romans 12 too, is that our lives are actually to look very, very different than the way the world looks. It says in Romans 12 too, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So while kind of going with the flow, I mean, it's easy to do. It's the flow. You know, it just, it just happens. There's a countercultural way to think and act that is more aligned with God's will for us. That's exactly right. We are called as believers, as, as followers of God, as people who recognize and adopt our call to stewardship, we are called to be different. We are called to think about these things differently, just like Paul said. So to think differently and to act differently, and this applies to every area of our life, but as we mentioned, it's often easiest to see and think about this in the way that we steward our finances. Paul wrote first about letting God renew our minds, but here's what God's Word says about what we have. First of all, the Bible says that it's all actually His. Right. right? <laughs> Let's just uh, put that out there. Yeah. God says, yo, this is mine. Uh, in Psalm 24, 1, it says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So if we start from that place. Right. And if we think about our money and our financial situation in terms of that, because I think that money falls into the earth and everything in it. Yeah, the everything. What does would, that not include? I would say, <laughs> now, Bitcoin, not sure. Not sure. Is that money? I don't know. No, I'm joking. Everything thing, falls. Everything <laughs> falls. Everything <laughs> falls into this category of belonging to God. Got it. So we start from that place. Second, unless we start to believe that since we earned it, it's ours. God reminds us in Deuteronomy eight eighteen, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. Right. So. Even if you think, well, I'm the one doing this stuff. Right. I should do it. God says, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Who gave you the ability to do this stuff? It's like, uh, who, who created you? Right. Who, who sustains you every day? Yeah. Who gave you strength? Who gave you the ability to learn the things that you learned? Right. You know, I could picture God in Job just exactly. saying, whoa, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Were you there Did when you I... create yourself? <laughs> Did you make yourself? Right. I don't think so. Yeah. No. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, again, what we're trying to do is paint this picture that when we're taking this concept of stewardship of all things and we put it and paint it in the financial light, it still all points back to God. Exactly. It's not just saying, oh, well, yeah, I can, I can consider my time that way or I can consider... I'm thinking about the earth that way or whatever, but my, but money, well, I mean, that's just paper and, and metal that jingles in my pocket, or that's just, again, whatever Bitcoin is, that's just that it's, right. um, I'm sure God doesn't really know yeah. it it's under this cat. The, there's a nice umbrella of all things, of all the, <laughs> <laughs> the everything. Exactly. So Another place that we see, you know, sort of our way to think about what we've been entrusted with when it comes to our money comes out of Luke 16. And that this has to do with the fact that he is entrusted to us, which we've talked about, but we are accountable back to him for what we do with it. Um, in Luke 16, 10 and 11, it says, if you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly we wealth, who will trust you? with the true riches of heaven. So between what we read in Matthew 25 and what we see here in Luke 16, God entrusts us, but he's also going to call us to account. And that can sound a little bit scary. <laughs> Just thinking about having to answer for what we've been given. But, but let's, we, let's not jump past that. Right. Right. It should instoke this immense, like, uh, what's the, what's the word? The gravity of the situation, yeah, the <laughs> right? Right. Um, because again, God doesn't just say that to make it sound serious. Right. God says it because he means it. Right, <laughs> right. And, and we don't know exactly what that'll look like, but we know that he will call us to account for what's been entrusted to us. Um, we see this again in Proverbs 27, it's verses 23 and 24. 
It says, be sure to know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever. Um, and again, this is just one of these places where it's like, you've been given these things. You need to pay attention. You need to keep watch. You need to know what's happening. Um, and so that takes effort and diligence and intentionality. And, you know, this is something that we grow in. This isn't something that you wake up one day and you go, oh, yep, I'm going to do that. And it, it comes really easily. It's something that we, we begin to learn and practice. And as we begin to think differently about what we have and our stewardship of it, our actions will follow. But remember that this is entirely countercultural, so it will take practice. Proverbs 21.5 says, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. There's no getting around the hard work of good stewardship. Um, it, is, it is work. It is hard. It takes, especially if you're, say, married, you and your spouse are going to have to really sit down and work to figure out how to do this together. Um, if you've got some bad spending habits, you're going to have to figure out how to, to rein those in so that you can learn to steward what God has given you. The good news is that this isn't something that you have to figure out or do on your own. Um, I love what it sells, says in Psalm 131. It's verses 1 to 3. It says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. So the good news is that God, not only has he called us to stewardship, but he's ready to help us and empower us and guide us and give us the self-control and give us the wisdom and give us all that we need in order to do this. Um, again, from Got Questions, I just, I love the writers over there because they say things in ways that make it just clear and understandable. He, they said that the stewardship that is required of us is not a result of our own power or abilities. The strength, inspiration, and growth in the management of our lives must come from God through the Holy Spirit working in us. Otherwise, our labor is in vain and the growth in stewardship is self-righteous human growth. So there's just this sense that Yes, there are things that we can do and habits we can build, but in all reality, we must lean on God for the strength and the power and the wisdom to do this well. That's great. So let's get, let's offer some practical first steps in sure. this, right? Sure. We are called to stewardship. And in this case, in, right now we're talking about, we're called the stewardship of our finances. So let's kind of, let's talk a little bit about some, so some easy steps to start sure. to take e even, even today, even this week. Anytime we talk about stewardship, I, I, I always like to encourage people to start by making a list for yourself of just everything that God has entrusted to, mm. uh, to you. Mm -hmm. To me, it's sobering yeah. to actually put this you know, to ink on paper mm -hmm. and see all the, you know, this list of things that God has entrusted to you. Sure. You know, and then be praying over that mm -hmm. and be thinking about, okay, am I doing a, as, a, as good a job as I can mm -hmm. to be a steward of this area, of, sure. of my family, of my spouse, of my finances, of my job, of my community, of my, you know, all these different things. Sure. And be creative in that. Mm -hmm. I don't let me, you know, cause there's a ton of things out there. Right. Think about it. Right. My health, my body, my, um, my, as we talked about before, uh, the gospel, right. You know, <laughs> d different things like that. So, so again, take, take time and really think that through. Second, um, I'd encourage you to consider making a budget. Mm -hmm. Just start to look at, okay, what have I been spending my money on? And then start to think about the different areas of where your money needs to go mm -hmm. and mark down those needs to goes first. Yeah. I need that, you know, it goes here, it goes here, it goes here, it goes here. And then you can start to build out those extra categories and then see, okay, so am I spending, you know, how am I doing at right. the end of the month? And you can use lots of different sorts of budget apps or software. Mm -hmm. um, we know that a, a good one is every dollar sure. by Dave Ramsey's company and stuff like that. So again, I, I, I encourage you to take that step. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say baby step, but that's probably trademarked by Ramsey. So I apologize yeah. 
I apologize if I overstepped a trademark. Um, <laughs> and then, and then if you want to dive a little bit deeper into your finances, uh, I encourage you to check out saddleback.com slash personal finances. And you can see some different workshops we have on there, some seminars we have on there, some different offerings for you to go deeper into the area of your financial health. So friends, uh, we hope that this was kind of, a, you know, it was a good, um, kind of overview mm-hmm. of, of the topic of stewardship, how we are called to a life of stewardship and how one area that we can really start to fine tune Mm -hmm. this calling in our life is in our financial health. So friends, we love you. We're praying for you as you embrace and enter this call of stewardship. And we will be back with you again next week. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes and go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week. (music) 